begin transmission. Parasitic infections were getting worse and worse, not that we're, they're showing up in our muscle tissue and not only in our intestines and our eyes. Um, we even started seeing some lesions in um, uh, brains. So this was a, it became a very, very serious problem. None of, our, none of our medication, our antivirals or antibiotics, none of our advanced uh, future medicine could save us from these parasites. So what we ended up doing was going back to nature. If these parasites are native on this planet, then that means that they and the hosts here probably have had a long history of um, arms race between them. The hosts will have some defensive mechanisms against these parasites that perhaps we lack. So Dr. Arnold and I went to investigate. We found a group of large vertebrates inhabiting the forbidding forest, and we watched them. And we took some of their stool samples, and we uh, sifted through it, and we looked for evidence of parasites, and we found a tremendous number. It seems that parasites are common here among all higher vertebrates. After that, we watched, we documented which um, animals had the highest parasite load, and then uh, documented their behavior. And over time, what we noticed was that the individual animals with the highest number of parasites in their stools preferentially would go to this one clump of plants, uh, pick it, peel it, and eat it. And it, it's, uh, we, tr we tried some, we tasted it. It has a horrible bitter flavor, and it's very, very woody, very pulpy. They can't be getting much nutrients from it. But after eating this plant, we went back and collected some more stool samples and sifted through it some more, and the parasite load plummeted. So whatever is in these plants is actually killing the parasites, which is remarkable. It seems that these, these animals are um, self-medicating. They um, realize consciously or subconsciously that something is wrong, and they recognize that this particular plant can help them. So they go, if they find it, uh, ingest the medicine, and are um, all but cured. So Dr. Arnold took a, a sample of this plant tissue back to the lab, and our biochemist, Dr. Cordyceris um, analyzed it and found some complex molecular markers that he then synthesized uh, to make synthetic proteins. From these, we made a medicine and it is now curing us all. Everyone has recovered remarkably well and are now uh, going about their lives as if nothing traumatic had ever happened. Everyone that is except for Adam Astronomer, our resident stellar navigator and cosmologist, she was the one with the uh, extreme intestinal blockage of these worms. We thought we had removed them all, and we thought she had uh, was on the road to recovery, but she uh, collapsed yesterday and was unresponsive and um, eventually um, passed away uh, last night about midnight. Dr. Mastronomer was a very valuable member of this crew, uh, got along well with everyone. Her excellent navigational abilities and perseverance is one of the main reasons we made it to this planet in one piece. So while um, during the, the intervals between our um, hibernations, I was primarily bored with nothing to study or do, it was um, Dr. Mastronomer and others who were uh, frantically navigating and making sure our trajectory was good and our speed was good and we weren't going to run into um, any difficulties. So she was a crucial member of this um, of of our of our crew, and uh, was incredibly intelligent and capable, and she will be sorely missed. It's a little surprising that she succumbed to this parasitic infection. We have uh, we had the right medicine, we have excellent care, and uh, it's it's a little mysterious why she why she succumbed. Um, in fact. Master Sergeant Rush um, is a little suspicious that her death was not a result of the parasitic infection. Um, our post-mortem analysis <clears throat> revealed a strange toxic chemical in her body, an unusual protein that didn't that none of our sensors um, could uh, reveal the source of. So it could have been something that the, the worms were secreting, or it could be an external source. Uh, we still need to run some more tests, but Rush is convinced that something or someone um, murdered her. It is almost too terrifying to think that someone we live with, that we've shared a 51-year voyage with, would now be killing members of this crew. Um, it seems ridiculous to me. Um, even still, it's good to be on guard, 
Uh, I trust uh, Rush uh, quite a bit. I trust his judgments and his character. So if he's concerned, um, I'm concerned too. Rush told me that he and Ada were supposed to meet to discuss some uh, something that Ada had discovered about another member of the crew, um, something that Ada didn't want to talk to him um, about over our communication devices. They were actually planning on meeting the day that she uh, died. So Rush is quite agitated. He is on a mission to figure out what happened to her. The worms that uh, infected poor Ada were Ascaris lumbricoides. We've named them Ascaris lumbricoides, the giant human roundworm. And we uh, scanned all of our tissues and took some samples from the life around the habitats, and we've been able to piece together their life cycle. And it's rather extraordinary. Um, they start off as little tiny eggs, and these eggs have a hard cyst-like structure on them that prevents desiccation and is resistant to uh, pH changes in the soil. And we estimate that these eggs can uh, persist in the soil for uh, many decades. So even if no suitable host wanders around for uh, 20 years, they could still be infected when uh, a suitable host does eventually um, arrive. If a suitable host rubs its paws or its hands in the soil and then gets the eggs on itself and then ingests them somehow in its, in its mouth or um, nose, then the eggs will hatch and travel down the esophagus into the stomach and hatch in the intestines where the juvenile worms will burrow out of the intestines into the blood vessels. From there, they'll travel up the, the blood vessels until they reach the lungs and then they'll burrow into and make a little home in the alveoli of the lungs. At this point, they can cause uh, severe pneumonia, and this is the symptoms we were seeing earlier in our uh, pneumonia patients, um, was a result of these juvenile worms using their little alveoli as a little jungle gym. The adult worms live in your intestines, and it's quite curious how they get from your lungs back to your intestines. Um, what they do when they're old enough um, is they crawl up the alveoli, up the bronchial tubes, um, up your throat, and then tickle the back of your throat, um, instigating a cough reflex. And what happens when we cough? <clears throat> um, almost always, we have a reflexive swallowing motion as soon as we cough. So what these worms are doing is they're triggering the cough. We cough them up from our lungs into the back of our throats, and then we swallow them back down into our stomach, um, pass into our intestines, where they will mature as adult worms. So we have all unexpectedly coughed sometime or another. There we feel a little catch in our, in our throats. Well, if that happens on this planet, there is a small possibility that that was a little Ascaris worm coughing up from your lungs, trying to get back down your throat into your intestines. So on Earth, of course, we don't have to worry about this anymore, but say maybe uh, a thousand years ago, uh, something like this could have been quite common. And so people um, who have that little unexpected <clears throat> catch in the throat, uh, maybe be a little cautious about that, if you ever, if you ever time travel, that is. Um, so, so today we'll talk about Ascaris a little bit more and its close relatives. We'll know, uh, we'll learn the biology and life cycle of several important human, human parasites. And um, from there, we'll be able to better combat them and uh, figure out a way to prevent getting reinfected. Today, what we will be learning about are nine species of nematodes. Um, almost all of them are parasitic, and many of them have caused significant pain to the crew over this past week, but some of them are free living. And I don't want you to get the wrong perception about uh, nematodes. Most of them are completely harmless, and uh, many more are commensals. It's just that the most important ones that are relevant to um, your knowledge, at least, are ones that can cause significant harm to you or your loved ones. So what we've actually done is there are there are two species of ne nematodes or nematode-like organisms that I remember from historical uh, zoology classes that were inhabitants of ancient Earth uh, before the second great dying. So we'll lear learn those two creatures. You may be familiar with them or you may not, depending on um, how strong your background is in historical zoology. And then uh, what our computers have done is we've taken the biology of the nematodes that we have discovered here on this planet and applied it to about a thousand years ago in a simulation. So we could kind of have an estimate for what life would be like 
in the past for humans and what life might be like here on this new planet without all the technology that we have available to us on Earth. So we'll begin with Cenorhabditis elegans. This is a very famous nematode from Earth's history and unfortunately is now extinct, but the knowledge we gained from this nematode is tremendous and was very influential in the development of um, genetics and devel developmental biology as disciplines early in the 20th century. Cenorhabditis elegans is a free-living uh, free living nematode, it's not parasitic at all, and it has a very simple body plan with only a uh, little over 900 cells in its body. They were able to synthesize the entire genome of this organism. It was one of the first genomes to ever be sequenced. Not only the whole genome, but also the whole connectome of this worm was um, analyzed. So we know the developmental pathway from start to finish of every single neuron in this worm's body. And from this, uh, we could apply this to higher organisms, applying it to the human central nervous system, brain and development. So this is an invaluable resource for learning about humans eventually, because we have to start small and simple. The second nematode-like species that I can remember from historical zoology classes is a parasite called Dracunculus smenensis. This caused a disease, a terrible disease, called Dracunculiasis in its victims, and it, could grew, it grew to be over a meter long, living in the muscle tissue under the skin of human hosts. These are famous and um, they persisted, stories of them have persisted for so long because Dracunculus was the first parasitic organism to be completely eradicated because of human effort. This disease, um, common name guinea worms, these worms caused millions of people to suffer terrible pain as these worms burrowed under their skin and then eventually made a, a blister-like hole in their, uh, in their feet so that they could emerge to lay eggs in water. These worms caused severe economic loss in the regions as infected people couldn't, couldn't walk or work as effectively as uninfected could. In the late 20th century, a former president of the first American Republic, um, Jimmy Carter, and many doctors in Central Africa and nonprofit organizations coordinated a massive effort to eliminate this organism from the face of the earth. And after working for many, many decades, and uh, they eventually succeeded. So this was the first organism to be completely eradicated by human effort. Previously, to get rid of these organisms requires to slowly pull the worm out of the body as it emerges to lay eggs in the water. The challenge here is that it's a very thin, thread-like worm, and if you pull too hard, the worm may snap and then wriggle back up into your skin, leaking uh, fluids and causing massive infections. So you have to gently, every day, rotate the, the cloth a little bit at a time until the whole worm is wound up on the, on the cloth and then it, it can be extracted that way. Otherwise, uh, the majority of deaths by this worm occur because of infected wounds. This method of extracting the worms has been the go-to remedy for um, thousands and thousands of years. We have prehistoric documents from um, Egypt that document um, this method for removing these worms. So wherever in the Middle East or Africa, wherever humans were, these worms were present. And the best way that humans have to eliminate them is by wrapping these little worms around the stick. Interestingly, our modern uh, symbol for medicine is a snake on a stick. And the origins of this symbol are um, obscured by history, but some people hypothesize that um, a snake on a stick is reminiscent of Dracunculus being extracted from a human host. The people who would do this would be the medical professionals of that era, and so this symbol became representative of the, the physicians of whatever culture um, they were a part of. We also have a really interesting story in um, ancient scriptures um, in the Bible where there's a story of 
the Israelites being um, saved by God out of slavery in Egypt and then wandering around the deserts of the Middle East for a very long time. In that desert, they eventually disobeyed God and God sent fiery serpents to punish them for their disobedience. And this passage in the ancient scriptures says this, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Some commentators think that this is an ancient account of Dracunculiasis um, and uh, the, the worm, the serpent on a stick, the fiery serpents. And if you're wandering around in a desert, you're going to have little pockets of, of water, little oases that you're going to stop and rest at. In desert environments where the water is um, highly concentrated, the parasitic diseases also get highly concentrated. So some people think that this is a story of the Israelites stumbling onto an oasis that had been infected with Dracunculiasis eggs. The Israelites um, drinking that water, getting infected, and then appearing to be bitten by these fiery serpents. Interestingly, bronze, Moses, Moses made a bronze um, serpent and set it on a pole. The bronze is, has known anti-parasitic properties, and so using this, the, a bronze pole to remove the worm would also um, kill the worm. So I'm not, I'm not sure I believe this, but it's an interesting thing that some commentators have, have made note of. The life cycle of the guinea worm, as I mentioned, begins in the water and ends in a human host where the adults can grow up to three feet long. In the water, the eggs are ingested by these little tiny crustaceans called cyclops. They have a single, single eye there, that's why they're called cyclops, and other kinds of copepod-like crustaceans these water fleas, or cyclops, um, ingest the eggs and then the larvae hatch inside of them. When a human then um, drinks that water, the nice little crunchy parasitic carrier is dissolved in the intestines, um, in the stomach, but the, the worm survives and hatches in the intestines. It spends um, almost a year migrating through the body walls and growing until it becomes about three feet long. Once it's sexually mature, the, <clears throat> the males and females will find each other and mate and then migrate to the skin and usually on, on an extremity of the arms or the legs where they cause a heat blister to form. And this is remarkable because this heat blister, um, it preys upon the human natural instinct to calm and cool pain. And so if you have a, if you have a, a blister that feels like it's on fire, our natural reaction will be to find some cool water and put the wound in. As soon as you put the blister in the water, the worm will uh, burst through the blister and um, everse its uterus, expelling millions, um, millions of eggs into the water to be eaten by other cyclops, um, eventually infecting more people. So this is, this is a, again, caused uh, millions of people uh, personal and economic damage for um, millennia before it was eradicated in the um, early 21st century. Ascariasis is what we're calling the disease that um, ended up killing poor Dr. Ada Mastronomer. Um, Ascariasis is caused by Ascaris lumbricoides, the giant human roundworm. And as you can see here from one of the worms we extracted from Dr. Mastronomer's intestines, these are um, worm-like creatures, but they don't have apparent segments and they don't have the tentacles that we see on anelids. Rather, they have this shiny, hard cuticle that has to be periodically shed. We're familiar with tapeworms in, um, on, on Earth in some of the, the still uh, poverty-stricken areas on Earth. And tapeworms have a a nice scolex and hooks on it that they use to latch onto their host to keep from kind of being washed downstream of the intestines. These worms, however, don't have any adhering mechanism. Um, and so what they have to do, they have to be strong enough to kind of swim upstream and maintain their current course. We examine these worms in tissue by sending a little remote controlled probe into the intestines of some of the crew that was infected. And what we can see, so this is very similar to the, the sewer worms that we saw last time, except this little probe is in your own sewer system. 
instead of the, the habitat sewer system. And what we can see, we can see the head of the worm coming through and the worm is freely moving about inside the intestines. It's not attached, it's, um, it's, it's freely moving around. And just as a quick reminder of what can happen when these infections get really severe, here's that video again of us extracting the worms from uh, the intestines. Most of the time infections won't be this severe, but I think because we were in a small area and uh, we got reinfected many, 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 many times. Uh, most of the people who would get this naturally would only have one or two at the most. This type of infection would be extremely rare. We've discussed their life cycle a little bit, but it's, it's worth remarking on again. The eggs we see here are um, hardened cyst-like eggs that can persist in the environment for decades. And if we get these on our hands and ingest them, then the eggs can easily pass through the hydrochloric acid of our stomach and hatch in our intestines. The worms then migrate out of our intestines into our bloodstream where they eventually find their way to our lungs. And the juveniles will molt several times in our lungs, hanging out on our alveoli. And then once they're uh, mature, they will tickle the backs of our throats, cause us to cough. <clears throat> And then we swallow naturally, and that brings the, the worms back down into our intestines where they reproduce and eat for the rest of their, of their lives. In our simulations of ancient Earth, we saw that with a population of about 7 billion in, say, the, the late second um, millennium, there would be, on average, the infection of these would be so common, especially in rural and poverty-stricken areas that the infection rates on average across the whole world would be about one in six. So about a billion, over a billion people would be infected with this worm um, according to our simulation. Which means that in a group, let's say a group of, of this size, that there's about 42 of us, then so there would be seven of us infected with this worm if, if this class represented the the national, the average population of um, a simulated world in the year, say, 2020 instead of 3020. So about seven of us would have these worms in our intestine right now if we were the global average, which is pretty disturbing, honestly. And um, among those, several of, of us would have severe, um, some of us would have severe intestinal blockage, which again looks like this. One more time. This is, this is what happens and can lead to death in um, its host. So this is definitely not a worm we want to have um, infecting our new colony, and this is definitely a worm that um, we wouldn't want in ancient Earth either. The next worm we've encountered on this planet is called a hookworm, and we're calling it Nicator americanus. These worms, in contrast to Ascaris, they're much smaller, they're uh, usually less than an inch long, and they, uh, they don't cause as much damage. However, unlike um, Ascaris, which didn't have any attachment mechanism, Nicator species have these dorsal plates on their mouth that they use to latch onto your intestinal mucosa, and then they just imbibe the blood. Um, they tend to be pretty greedy, selfish little organisms, and drink way more blood than they can handle. And so the, the worst complication we've seen from these, uh, from infection with hookworms is severe anemia, which leads to lethargy. And in, in our simulations of, of Earth, um, here they are about, uh, about very, uh, smaller than a matchstick, um, usually just uh, a few millimeters long. They're, they're not as scary as Ascaris is. Um, and their, their life cycle is quite similar to Ascaris as well. They will still uh, mature in your lungs and be coughed up and then swallowed. Adults live in your intestine, but they don't, you don't get infected by eating their eggs. Rather, the juveniles, the eggs are shed in human feces, and then wherever there's human waste, the eggs will hatch and the juveniles' worms will start crawling about. If you walk in bare feet, which apparently some members of our crew were doing, um, which we now know, right? We, we now know is not a, a good idea to walk around in our um, sewage with bare feet, but you know, live and learn. Well, anyway, if you, if you walk around in bare feet in 
um, dirt or fertilizer or fields um, or rivers that have been contaminated with human waste, the worms can crawl into your feet and from there they enter your bloodstream and migrate to your lungs. So here you can see the little path a worm has taken um, through the skin into the blood bloodstream. And you see the, the physical pain that this is going to cause and then eventually it can cause anemia and lethargy, especially if you have a large infection of hookworms. So these are hookworms, uh, Nicator americanus. In our simulations of Earth uh, a thousand years ago, we found that they would be extremely prevalent in um, neotropical areas, especially in rural and poverty-stricken areas, without access to uh, clean drinking water. So quite similar to Dracunculus, Ascaris, Nicator, uh, collectively, these guys can be called uh, ne neglected tropical uh, diseases because they're going to predominantly affect those who are already suffering from um, poor food and sanitation conditions. I want to also point out here, just to keep in the back of your mind, remember this uh, simulated map because where there's not very many hookworms, there used to be. So in the first American Republic, the, uh, in the early 20th century, hookworms were quite prevalent and it was only with a concerted um, effort to eradicate them that numbers became uh, less. Same with Europe. <clears throat> but I want to point out that these, these white areas here, I just remember that, just remember this data for, for now. We're going to talk about um, autoimmune disorders and see how the, the prevalence has kind of flipped and maybe a potential reason why that is. So keep this in the back of your mind. Some members of our crew decided to taste some of the local game, and so uh, they ate several um, several different species. And apparently, when you do that, you uh, run the risk of getting infected with Trichinella spiralis um, and getting trichinosis in your muscle tissue. The trichina worm is found here. You can see it here, and you can see it here in the muscle tissue. If you ingest meat with Trichinella spiralis uh, juveniles or eggs in it, the, they will migrate out of your intestines into your muscle tissue and insist. And they actually burrow into the muscle cell itself and transform the muscle cell into something called a nurse cell. They secrete some type of genetically mo genetic modification uh, protein where the muscle, the genes that are expressed in the muscles actually change. And so the muscle becomes uh, uh, larger and it starts drawing more nutrients to it and it basically becomes a little incubation for this, this little worm. This is a pretty brilliant move on the worm's part because our immune system is on the lookout for these worms and if you can hide within our own tissue then our immune cells won't recognize that this is a foreign invader. So Trichinella spiralis evades our immune system by becoming our own cells and then they make the cell grow larger, um, transform it into a nurse cell, and uh, make the cell bring nutrients to it. Here's a particularly nasty one as well. Uh, these are pinworms, and these ones are very small. What you see here is a scanning electron uh, micrograph of the two microvilli of your intestine. So these are the microvilli of your intestinal wall. They're used to absorb nutrients, and these are the threadworms or pinworms. They're quite small, and you'd have to look very, very closely to see them with the naked eye, and most of the time it's going to require um, a microscope. And they live in your lower intestine. The, the genus and species name is Enterobius vermicularis, and in our simulations of the year 2020, these were the most common infective um, worms in industrialized nations. So if you remember that chart with uh, the hookworms, um, pinworms are very common in the neotropics as well and in poverty-stricken areas, but they're also common in um, Europe and America and uh, uh, China and Russia where we have, where <clears throat> in our simulated worlds, so we had better access to healthcare and sanitation. The reason for this is uh, they, they are so small and they're easily passed between person to person, especially within a household or within a small community or a daycare. Um, and so the, the, more the more people are in contact with each other, the higher infection rates get. 
In the first American Republic, our simulations indicated that over 40% of um, people living in the first American Republic in the year 2020, 40% of people would have had pinworms at some point in their life, which is uh, a remarkably high number. Uh, thankfully, they don't cause a lot of problems unless they get um, enormously abundant in your intestines. Um, but the, the main problem they can have is with uh, childhood growth and development. Unfortunately, it's children who are the most commonly infected, and that's because of the way they are infected. You can see the adult here, and like I said, the adults live in your large intestine. And they have a another brilliant but um, incredibly gross way of transmitting themselves to um, a new host or to reinfect their current host, they can tell when your metabolism changes during sleep. And so, like I said, they live in your lower uh, colon, your lower large intestine, and when you're sleeping, the female worms will migrate out of your body, out of your anus, and then lay eggs all around your anus, uh, adhering them to your tissue with this glue-like secretion. And so every night they migrate out, lay a bunch of eggs, and this glue-like secretion also is, it makes you itch. And so while you're sleeping, um, you'll itch and you'll get the eggs on your, your pajamas or your bedclothes or your fingers. And then if, if throughout the next day you put your finger in your mouth or your, um, your kids touch um, uh, where they're not supposed to and they put their, their fingers in their mouth, this is how reinfection occurs. Then after they lay their eggs, the females crawl back up inside to their nice cozy home and just stay there until the next night. So they know when you're sleeping, they know when you're awake, um, they lay eggs around your anus. So uh, watch out for these, for goodness sake. So pin, <laughs> pinworms are Enterobius vermicularis. Um, the way you understand infections, the way you document infections is something called the scotch tape test and you would take some tape and uh, just press it around the anus and then peel it off and then you can look under the microscope for eggs that look like this. So these are eggs of the pinworm on a scotch tape test and uh, you can see the numerous eggs there. Um, so infection rates can get really high especially in daycares or um, elementary schools where hygiene where kids haven't really learned good hygiene and they're just willing to, willing to touch anything and then touch anything else and not wash their hands. So wash your hands. Our next three parasites belong to a group that we're calling filarial worms and these are the ones that um, caused um, our botanist hand to swell, Dr. Arnold's hand to swell, and uh, so these three worms that we're going to talk about next are uh, generally called filarial worms. Filarial worms are um, very small and they're vector transmitted. They have uh, juvenile forms that are known as microfilariae, and these microfilariae are transmitted by usually an invertebrate vector, a mosquito, or some other type of fly. Um, as far as we can tell, those are, those are the most common vectors. So filarial worms are small, require a vector, and their juveniles are called microfilariae. The specific one um, shown here is Wuchereria bancrofti, um, or the, the filarial worm that causes elephantiasis. Elephantiasis, we're naming that after the swollen appendages that we saw on Dr. Arnold. And these are transmitted by these little muscaitos, the little flies, and the muscaitos um, have this piercing mouth part that they use to drink your blood. And while they're secreting these anticoagulant enzymes to keep your blood flowing, they're also secreting microfilaria um, into your blood. In elephantiasis, these microfilariae then migrate throughout your lymphatic system and clog up your uh, lymph nodes and your lymph ducts. And this causes um, edema, so a swelling um, of, of tissues as fluid accumulates and your immune system is trying to fight back against these worms. This can lead to some severe <clears throat> complications in our sim simulations in people infected with this. Um, this is prim primarily going to affect extremities, your legs, your hands, but also anywhere where lymph nodes accumulate, so also in the genitals or breast or armpit region. So these, this can cause lots of problems, and in our simulations, this was primarily a neotropical 
disease, especially in the Middle East and India and um, uh, Africa. And uh, millions of people would be infected with this if this was um, if this was existent in the year 2020. Our next filarial worm is called Oncocerca volvulus, and Oncocerca similarly is transmitted by a vector, but it's not transmitted by a mosquito. In this case, it's transmitted by something we're calling a black fly because it is black and small. The black fly is different than the mosquito. It has shorter antenna, it's got a little hump on its back, and um, it doesn't have a long mouth part, so it plunges its mouth part in to suck up your blood, and the abdomen doesn't um, visibly distend with your blood. Even still, the salivary glands um, secrete little microfilaria of Oncocerca into your bloodstream, and from there, they migrate throughout your tissue, causing um, severe damage. In our simulations, they cause something called river blindness, and uh, black flies, um, black flies live in their larvae are aquatic, and so this is going to be kind of restricted to wherever there are rivers, and aquatic environment for the black fly, the vector of Oncocerca, to um, live abundantly. Um, river blindness in our simulations primarily affected Central African populations, and there were some areas where um, everybody over the age of 40 um, had gone blind from this disease. The, the reason they go blind is the parasite wanders across the, through the connective tissue and under the skin, and if, if it, wherever it goes, the immune system is trying to um, uh, find it, stop it, kill it, and oftentimes scar tissue is created along the pathway of this worm. So if this worm eventually migrates across your eyes, like we were seeing um, earlier with one of our crew members, the uh, scar tissue could form and eventually the infected person could lose their sight. So Oncocercovolvulus is uh, the, the causative agent of river blindness. Another filarial worm, this one doesn't seem to be infecting um, us at all, but when we were sampling the local um, fauna here for parasitic um, worms, we found this one, Dirofilaria imitis. This is the canine heartworm. And these worms are also transmitted by mosquitoes, but they are transmitted to um, uh, dog-like creatures that we found here. Of course, in 3020, we still have uh, domesticated dogs because uh, they're the best. They would, of course, survive the great dying. But there are also dog-like creatures here that have these that have these worms, and they can block the um, the valves of the heart and obviously lead to uh, severe lack of energy, um, lack of oxygen production, um, muscle atrophy, and death if they get too um, abundant. So with a simple pill, we can cure these now. And so if you were living in the year 2020 and you did have a dog, um, you, would, you would be wise to always give your dog heartworm medication. Uh, otherwise, your dog would almost assuredly get this even in um, a place like the First Republic of America. So make sure your, your dog, in whatever year you are living, make sure you take care, care of your dogs. Now, uh, parasites and your immune system, is, is this is a really interesting interaction because our immune systems are designed to prevent damaging infections from um, foreign invaders like these parasites. However, uh, the parasites are also adapted to evade our immune system. And we saw with some, like uh, Trichinella spiralis, they, um, they insert themselves into our own cells and kind of evade detection that way. Um, others, like the hookworm, suppress our immune system um, almost systemically, and so our, our, they secrete this protein that uh, makes the, the whole immune system less rigorous. And this is quite interesting because in human, in the immune system, there's something called um, IgE or immunoglobulin E. And this is a specific part of our immune system that seems to be adapted for looking for parasites um, uh, specifically. And it's usually not very abundant, but this is what gets recruited by the immune system and identifies the, the pathogenic um, parasite and then uh, works to destroy it. So most of the time with, um, parasitic diseases, it's going to be IgE that's helping our bodies fight the infection. This is actually Cenorhabditis elegans, so it's not a parasitic worm, 
and the, all those little moving things you see are uh, white blood cells being recruited by IgE to the, par to the, the pathogen. So we can see for a non-parasitic nematode that would invade our system, our body would recognize it and destroy it immediately. Um, hookworms are parasites, and so um, they would normally activate the same pathway that this C. elegans is, but they suppress it. So remember that map of hookworm prevalence in our simulations? If you made a map similarly of um, uh, autoimmune disorders, the map would be flipped and you would find a, a high number of autoimmune disorders in industrialized wealthy nations with, with um, lots of medicine and lots of health care. So the first American Republic and um, the European countries, um, Australia, um, there's lots of autoimmune disorders. And IgE is plays an important role in a lot of uh, autoimmune disorders. So uh, there um, were some people back in the 2020s that actually recommended um, infecting yourself with these parasites, um, specifically hookworms. So you could take a little pill of hookworms. And the idea is that the hookworms would suppress your IgE immune system and it wouldn't go crazy attacking itself because there are no parasites to attack. With removing all these parasites from the ecosystem, our bodies have adapted to control them and uh, a lot of the autoimmune disorders that plagued the the early half of the um, third millennium may have been avoided if we had um, a slightly higher rate of parasitic infection. On the other hand, you have the parasites. So uh, that's not great either. <clears throat> well, that's all I have for you today. We have these, these species of nematodes to learn. Uh, make sure you know their biology, their classification, um, a little bit about how they get, how a human would get infected both on this planet and in simulations of Earth's past. Know how many are infected and where adults and juveniles live. I will talk to you soon in transmission.